from diabetic seminar. I took over the diabetic teaching here at the hospital a couple years ago and really have enjoyed it and met a, a lot of really wonderful people that have diabetes. Um, I think fall is almost over and winter is on us almost <laughs> and I feel that it's a really good time for us to get in touch with our diabetes. Um, there is a lot to know um, and I'm still learning and it takes um, a lot of upkeep to keep all of the knowledge going. Um, today we're going to have several speakers. We're going to have um, me, I'm the diabetic educator. Christy Thompson is a registered dietitian. John Agin is our pharmacist here at the hospital and Linda Coates is a physical therapist and they will also be giving um, a half hour presentation each. So I will get started with um, what diabetes means to the general population. The incidence of diabetes is 15.7 million people um, in the United States have diabetes. I'm not sure about what the world is. The um, information that I received was just on the, on the uh, United States. Uh, diagnosed is 10.3 million and undiagnosed is 5.7 million. Um, so there is quite a few people in our population that still are undiagnosed. Um, this week at the hospital, um, I had a patient that just, he's sitting right here, <laughs> it was just diagnosed, he's brand new, so he's a little bit nervous about it, I think, but he's coming along fine. He's just starting his diabetic injections and trying to get his diet under control and his exercises, so. Um, approximately 2,200 people are diagnosed each day. And diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death each year from stroke, heart attack, kidney disease, and neuropathy leading to amputations. And I don't know if everyone understands what neuropathy is. Um, it's a disease of diabetes that's caused by damage to the nerves as a result of metabolic and vascular abnormalities of diabetes, which leads to blockage of nerve impulse transmissions. Um, it usually begins in the toes and then to the legs, and it usually starts five years after being diagnosed. And they call it uh, neuropathy, which the lay people say they feel like it's a dying back of their nerves and their feet. Um, if you all would like to turn into your packets, um, I made up uh, a full sheets on what I'm talking about today. It's called Managing Diabetes. It should be on the right side. Um, so what is diabetes? Diabetes is a genetic condition starting with the body's pancreas being unable to produce insulin in adequate quantities and to decrease the level of glucose in the blood. The beta cells, which are the islets, in the islets of Langerhams and the pancreas, are defective, allowing no insulin to be secreted at all, as is in type 1 diabetics, and very little quantities to be secreted, as in type 2 diabetes. There is not enough insulin produced to bind the receptors on target cells throughout the body. This leads to the cell's passageways being blocked the, the glucose cannot enter the cells for glucose metabolism to begin. And you can see up here on the diagram, um, the insulin tries to get into the cell and it gets in on receptor sites. And um, a normal person, there's no problem. It's secreted in from the pancreas. And actually what happens is the glucose that we eat actually goes, um, is released from the stomach and then the pancreas tries to um, go in and take care of that glucose. But some, in diabetes, the passageways are blocked, and so you don't hardly get any insulin at all. And that's on type 2 diabetics, and type 1 diabetes it's completely blocked, and there is no insulin secreted at all. So um, that diabetic type 1 is usually diagnosed in around uh, the age of 20 to 30. Um, so what happens in our bodies, the blood sugar rises and the sugar or glucose does not enter the cells so the body cannot get its energy that it needs. And so the diabetic feels very tired and listless. 
and they finally get to the point where they're so sick that they have to seek medical attention because they're just not able to function on their uh, regular daily basis of what they would like to do in, with their lives. So my next um, handout that I have that you can see on the screen is people wonder where the pancreas actually is. Pancreas lies under the stomach and it's just right here is the organ where the pancreas is. And you can see by the diagram that the food that we eat um, tries to go in through the stomach and it's excreted and then it makes the insulin cell, insulin from the islets of Langerhams, um, it makes the, that take over and it tries to um, digest the glucose. But with diabetes you don't have um, the insulin secretion as much. And so there is a definite problem. And so what happens, the blood uh, sugar just continues to rise. So what is glucose metabolism? It's a process in which the carbohydrates, protein, and fats from food are converted into energy by the cell. Um, the glucose in our body is our major fuel source, which gives us energy to be able to do our daily functions. So you can see on the diagram that the um, glucose is secreted and the pancreas then in turn is stimulated to go in and take care of that sugar that's being released. And whatever sugar goes out into the bloodstream, um, the excess goes into the liver goes into muscle cells and it goes into the adipose tissue or the fat tissue. Can you all see that okay or is that blurry? Can you all see it? You have a handout on it too. So what foods gives us glucose? Um, many of you maybe don't know um, when I first took over diabetes teaching here at the hospital, I didn't realize that actually milk sugar and some of these others um, were actually made into the end products of glucose in our bodies. So it includes table sugar, milk sugar, fruit sugar, and starches. So when we calculate our diabetic diets, it's important to remember that fruits, milk, and starches are also converted into sugars and these all can cause the blood sugar to rise unless calculated into our diet plan. So what is the most important thing that affects us, our diabetes today? What we need to do is to keep our blood sugars down into normal range. And that usually is determined by the doctor. He usually tells us um, what he wants our thresholds to be. And uh, why do we need to do this? And very important reason is to uh, prevent diabetic complications. A uh, month ago, I went to an all-day diabetic seminar in Des Moines, and a lady was the presenter from Boston University, and she, she taught at the college. And what she really stressed was that um, in order to keep our blood sugars down, that we need to watch our diets very strictly to try to exercise, keep our blood pressures down. And the complications that arise are a lot, a lot of different complications. Get that center dry for us. Is that blurry? A little blurry. Um, first problem is that the eyes, um, blindness causes a lot of problems for diabetics. And it's leading cause of new cases of blindness aged 20 to 74 years old. And every year 1,200 to 2,400 people lose their sight to, blind, to diabetes. Um, and then the next one is neuropathy, which I already discussed, but it um, is, affects the nerves and also the feet. Um, the feet, you get a tingling sensation when it first starts, and it's usually about five years after diagnosis. Uh, a diabetic 2 patient usually has diabetes 
between five to seven years before they ever realize that they have it. And it's with the symptoms that they're having that causes them to go to the doctor. And so usually whenever the diabetic goes to uh, get some doctor attention, he has already um, got some neuropathy started. Um, so we need to do everything we can as nurses and doctors to try to treat the neuropathy. And I will go into that a little more later. And also, the cardiovascular system is also affected. The blood vessels um, become really kind of hard and knotty because the sugar goes in and it's really sticky and it starts sticking into the arteries and the veins. And so what happens then is all of the sugar is really sticky. Um, all of the fat deposits that we eat in our food starts collecting along all of the arteries and the veins. And um, then our blood sugars just go up and also our cholesterol and that in turn goes up. Um, and that's really a um, thing that people are really concerned about is their high cholesterol these days because it can lead to stroke, heart attack, and a lot of circulatory problems. So uh, cardiovascular um, diabetics are two to four times more likely to have heart disease, um, stroke, and actually die from heart attacks than the other general population. So how do we uh, reduce um, these complications? The um, main things that I have read, it says make sure that you stay on your calorie diet. Um, whatever the doctor tells you that your diet should be, that's what you should try to do, and I know it's really hard these days when you go out to eat and you try to, um, you know, maintain it. It's really hard in the fast living that we have today because we're always going here and there, and and we don't stay home like Grandma used to do and cook meals and all. And so it's really hard to stay on our diets because when you go out to eat, you you think what, you know, really what should I eat? What should I be doing? So I'm sure Chris will go into that a little bit more later about what to do um, whenever you go out eat to eat. She's sitting over here in the corner, so I know she's going to be happy to come up and talk. <laughs> um, so what else should we do? Um, make sure that we take our appropriate insulin and our medication or oral medicine and make sure you take it on time so that you don't space it out so much because that makes your blood sugars kind of go awry and they go up and down too much. So if you can try to stay on a regular regime with your um, medications and your insulin. And another thing you need to watch for skin breakdowns. Um, you need to check inside your shoes every day. <clears throat> Wear comfortable shoes. Don't let anything rub on your feet and make sure you check in between your toes and all over your feet every day. It's very important to do that. Um, my husband's uh, father was a diabetic and this is one example he had a tack that was up in his shoe, and he had the neuropathy where he didn't feel any, any pain in his feet. And he went that way for almost a month and a half with that tack up into his foot. And he ended up getting gangrene and losing about four toes. So um, as the diabetics get older, you really need to uh, realize that this neuropathy does set in and the numbness and all, so you don't really have a lot of feeling in your feet. So um, you need to make sure that you check that daily. And if you start having redness or you start having like some pus coming out of certain areas on your feet or a lot of soreness that won't heal, you need to make sure you get to the doctor and see what can be done. So uh, what are some other specific minders for people? that have diabetes, you need to uh, watch your blood sugar. Um, you need to, the target blood pressure that uh, the lady from the, that was from Boston University said that people um, in middle age should keep their blood pressures between 130 over 80, and that would be a target that she thought that most diabetics should keep their blood pressures at that range. Um, and we also need to, uh, every three months, have a hemoglobin A1C. And um, usually uh, a new diabetic 
a lot of times will be up into the 9 or 10 range. Uh, Non-diabetic would be probably 6 and under for an A1C. So you need to um, see where you're at on that range. Uh, be great for a diabetic to be 7 and under. 8 and 9, that is way too high. And um, that tells us, the A1C tells us how we're managing our um, blood sugars over a three month period. I don't know how many of you guys here uh, today have had your A1Cs drawn. Um, sometimes when you're in the doctor's office they don't always tell you like what your lab results are. So you need to make a note to make sure that you ask the doctor what your results are. Because sometimes they get so busy that they don't remember to tell us. And that's one of the very important um, treatment things that we can do because if you are above 8 or 9, um, it's dangerous for complications. Is that your liver function? Um, that is a, te a blood test that you get taken and it tells um, what your um, blood sugar is and how you manage it over three months. It doesn't, no, I'm sorry. doesn't um, work with liver, it's just um, a blood test that you have drawn at the doctor's office. And for every 1% reduction of your A1C, there's a 35% reduction in, in risk symptoms. And um, so it's very important that every time you can get it down 1%, that just keeps you from having more problems later on. So, um, and also, um, I know it's really gonna be hard through the, do through the uh, season of Christmas and Thanksgiving to keep your weight down. Um, the, in my other part of my packet, I have some ideas on how to reduce um, gaining weight and how to keep your weight down through the holidays. Uh, I won't go into that um, right at this time, but you can read it when you go home. And you also need to watch for your salt intake because that makes us retain fluid and also makes our blood pressures go up. And you need to make sure that you keep your uh, cholesterols down. Um, and the doctors around uh, medical arts and Fairfield Clinic usually draw a cholesterol every six months for a diabetic. So you need to make sure that you have that done to see where you're at. Um, you will see the parameters in your uh, handouts where your bad cholesterol is called your LDL and that for a diabetic should be under 100 and your good cholesterol which is your HDL should be above 55. And so exercise, um, there's new research that shows that um, the exercise can ac actually raise the HDL, which is your good cholesterol, and it can actually lower the um, LDL, which is um, brand new in research today. I, I wasn't aware of that and hadn't read it in any of my uh, publications until I went to this conference. So it's very important to exercise, and Linda will go into that more later. And it also, exercise helps you to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. And it just, as we get older, we get stiffer, and it's so much better for us to be able to move our bodies. Our joints get stiff, so it's really important. So what are the types of diabetes? You probably all are aware of what they are. Type 1 is uh, juvenile onset and it's insulin dependent always because the um, pancreas totally shuts down and it doesn't even function. And it usually happens with a child. Um, I've, I've seen some children even born with it, but sometimes three months up through maybe age 30, 35. And there are some adults that also can get type 1 diabetes, but that's pretty rare. Um, so what happens in our bodies, there's a, an autoimmune system that takes over for type 1 diabetics and it's genetic. They usually have parents or grandparents that have diabetes plus a trigger. And what is the trigger that actually um, makes the diabetes start in their body? It's usually a virus um, and now they're thinking also environmental toxins and drugs. Uh, drugs play a, a large part in sometimes that can, you know, maybe like a genomycin or something like that, a strong antibiotic can throw someone that's already prone to maybe starting to get diabetes, it shuts that pancreas down just a little bit more. In a type 1 diabetic, the disease appears suddenly and progresses very quickly, 
and the beta cells, which John will talk about also with his drug presentation, are just totally destroyed. And ketosis, um, a lot of type 1 diabetes patients uh, get ketoacidosis, and that's very dangerous, and I'll talk more about that later. So um, these people that have this are usually um, very thin. They um, come in with increased thirst, increased urination, and you say, why do they have increased thirst? Because the body gets dehydrated when they first become diabetics, and the urination increases, and we wonder why that is. And the reason for the increased urination, urination is the high blood sugars in their bodies may reach anywhere from 3 to 400 to 500 and that blood sugar finally reaches a threshold where it stops and the body can't or the blood can't have any more of it and so it's actually spilled into the urine then. They get very tired and they have very little energy and then they go to the doctor um, sometimes they have ketoacidosis and that's very dangerous. Um, that's when um, the body, the pancreas is totally shut off and the body starts using its fat stores. And after the fat stores are starting to be used up, har harmful byproducts um, called ketones are released into the um, bloodstream and that causes coma and causes them to be very more listless. And they say between 50 to 85 percent of people that come in um, are very close to death when they reach the hospital door. After the type 1 diabetes person um, uh, gets started on insulin, a lot of times they can totally go off of insulin because their body goes into what the doctors call a honeymoon phase. And that's when the overstressed beta cells are given a rest after having to work so hard to try to push out insulin they can't do. And so what happens is then they um, are again able to secrete insulin because they've had a chance to rest because they've been given insulin. And uh, then the person it maybe could even go off of their insulin for maybe two to three months. And then all of a sudden it, they make a backslide and they have to start taking it again. So um, it's very sad when a, a small child gets diabetes. Um, their parents are probably stressed because they have to uh, monitor their sugars very constantly and give them injections that little children don't like. And it's a very stressful time until um, they reach some kind of um, uh, treatment phase that works for both the mother and father as well as the diabetic child. So how many of you in here are type 2 diabetics? Probably everyone. Is everyone a type 2 diabetic? Okay, we're going to talk about that now. Type 2 diabetes usually starts before age 30 and they're non-insulin dependent. Um, the disease progresses through middle age and can lead to insulin dependency. 90% of people have a family history. Um, and it's very high in uh, Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, and uh, Pacific Islanders, and also in the Southwest Pima Indians. They're, that is the highest um, amount of the population of that group that just, they say over 95% of the Pima Indians that live in the Southwest part of the United States have it. So, um, so what symptoms do a type 2 person have? Symptoms of increased thirst, increased urination, increased hunger, weight loss, fatigue, blurred vision, slow healing of cuts, and usually the glucose is over 200. And the important part um, to understand that there's a three-fold uh, defect in the person's body. First, the beta cells start decreasing the amount of insulin, and the body cells will not allow the insulin to enter the passageways also into the cell that I discussed earlier. And then the liver detects a problem in their body and it starts releasing more, um, in, more sugar from the liver. So, um, so the main thing that we can do is to monitor. Um, I don't, the doctor will tell you how many times that he wants you to check your blood every day. Um, 
but the lady in um, at Boston University said it was very important. That was the most the main thing that she said. Monitor and know where your numbers are. It's it's just so critical so that you do not get complications. And you need to monitor um, your fasting usually in the morning. Your fasting. Uh, should be between 80 and 120, and your bedtime should be 100 to 140. Um, your two hour after meals should be 160 to 180. So um, it's very important. So high uh, blood sugar, where did you find the paper here? High blood sugar is another thing that we have to worry about. And what are the symptoms of hyperglycemia when a person comes in? And there's probably quite a few of you that can testify to all of these. Frequent urination, hunger, drowsiness, blurred vision, nausea. And those are probably all things that you've had to deal with through your life. So what do you do whenever your blood sugar goes low? There's several things that you can do. You need to make sure that you test your blood sugar to see what your range is. And then you take um, glucose tablets that you can get at the uh, pharmacy. You take three or four of those. You can also take a half a glass of orange juice. And that usually is measured to be half a cup. Um, when I first started nurses training, they always said add sugar to the orange juice. Now they say that they shouldn't do that because um, it causes the blood sugar to swing too high and then whenever that starts wearing off and then you have too a uh, fast drop. So you should just take one half of a glass of orange juice without any sugar. You can also take a small box of raisins, um, three teaspoons of jelly, and um, you could probably have three or four soda crackers. And that will greatly help. <coughs> So what are the symptoms of low blood sugar? You can uh, probably read. Shaking, sweating, tingling, personality change, dizziness, staggering, hunger, blurred vision, nervousness, drowsiness, headache, fatigue. And the reason is, is that you have not enough food in your bodies or uh, your medication is starting to work overtime and there's too much maybe insulin if you're on insulin. And it's a very scary thing. I've been through it quite a few times with patients. There's a 15 to 15 rule now that um, is out in the literature today. That means 15 grams of carbohydrates, which is the orange juice or the tablets. Um, and you check your blood sugar every 15 minutes until it gets up to a range above 80. If you're still dropping, then a lot of times uh, the doctors will say, that you should get glucagon and keep it in your refrigerator at home. And what it is is a um, solution that you mix with a powder and then um, the person either will give it to themselves, they can't get their sugar up, or one of their family members will be trained to do it and you mix the solution with the powder and then you give it directly into the leg or the stomach. And that will usually bring it up within 15 minutes. So there is another thing that you can have on hand if you're continually dropping and you can see that you're not going to bring it up. So you need to keep a daily record of your daily blood sugar levels. Keep track of your fasting as well as if you are an insulin um, dependent type 1. They'll have um, them do post breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But most of the time, uh, type 2 diabetics usually check theirs uh, 7 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon. And out on the market now, there's a brand new um, monitors. And it is very um, wonderful to see all of these new monitors coming in. There's the AccuCheck that um, I usually have my patients get. There's also a Glucometer Elite. And this is a wonderful little instrument. You put your test strip in, and then you just uh, get a little drop of blood, and the strip actually sucks the blood up. And it's really easy for people, especially uh, for a person that's in their 70s or 80s, 
they really have a hard time pricking their finger and dropping that little drop of blood on that little test strip. And a lot of times they waste so many. So this is, uh, has been out probably three or four years. And that has really revolutionized things. Um, there's many, many um, monitors on the market today. There's a freestyle. And these um, new monitors, you can get the blood out of your arms uh, or your legs instead of pricking your finger because that's pretty sensitive. Um, they, these are fairly accurate, but um, some people have told me that they have trouble keeping their, uh, getting an accurate reading. There's a new voice master out for the blind diabetic and soft tack, um, which automatically uh, you put your um, sample on and it's applied to a test strip and it continually monitors your sugars every 15 minutes. And in your literature, I put a, uh, a couple sheets on the brand new uh, Gluco watch and it's a laser and you wear it like a watch and it's just in testing now and you don't have to have uh, blood and it's, it has like a little piece of a, a filament under there and it uh, tests what your sugar is and so that's without having to have um, a blood test but the only worst part about that is that it costs $600 <laughs> And uh, the other worst part is that you still, in order to get the machine calibrated and all, you have to have at least two blood sticks, one every 12 hours. So you're still, you're still checking your blood, you know, even like with the old one, and you still have to do it with this one even though, just to make sure it's calibrated. So um, I think as more manufacturers um, in the pharmaceuticals do, um, get this instrument out, I think there's only one of uh, the freestyle that does it now, that the more that people get it out, I think um, that it'll, the price will go down. So I don't know how many of you have trouble getting your blood sugars, um, blood on your strips, but if you're really cold in the winter time and you're having trouble, um, I read some articles that said you should milk your hands down like this and milk the fingers to get the blood down and shake and then uh, usually you can get it. But a lot of times older people, especially with circulatory problems, have a hard time getting blood. And I don't know if anyone's had that trouble, but that seems to work. I've tried it with the patients in the hospital and I don't have any problem um, doing it. So, um, And um, now when you do finger sticks, as well as insulin injections, you do not have to use alcohol anymore. And I know uh, with some um, people that are on a fixed income, that can be a cost factor for them. And so if you just wash your fingers and you know where your injection site's gonna be and dry it really well with soap and water, then that's sufficient. So, um, and so when you inject insulin, um, you use the appropriate syringe um, and you make sure that uh, you recap them and you can use your same insulin syringe four or five times as long as there isn't barbs on it. Um, and that's just something brand new um, that a lot of people I've known in the past have put alcohol inside their syringes. They think that's a good way to wash it out. But they say as long as you just recap your needle, um, as you can use it four or five times, my husband does. He um, doesn't seem to have any problem with that. So, And you always take your diabetic medicine um, when you're ill. Um, on sick days, drink plenty of liquids. Check your blood sugars every four hours. And I think I already talked about foot care. You wear comfortable shoes and don't go um, walking barefoot. And then the neuropathy, I discussed that already. Um, you should uh, go to the uh, eye doctor at least every six months to a year, whatever he prescribes because blindness is a great complication that we have to worry about these days. Um, so what happens is that because of the high sugars, there is, they go into the eye also and it makes red blood cells start breaking apart and then you get like little scoriations on your eye. And um, what you have to have done then if it causes floaters, if you have some problem with uh, your vision, a lot of times they will take a laser and break that apart.
so um, let's see here. And like I said, exercise is very important. So I've got a little handout here. When you start exercising, you don't want to get real excited about doing it like this lady. <laughs> <laughs> so if you start out gradual, then it works better than just getting really excited about doing it. I need to get back this way. And I wanted to show you some sites for injections. I don't know how many of you are on insulin. But um, you can use legs, thighs, buttocks, arms, and stomach. And you need to rotate those injection sites. And a brochure on my foot care that I didn't quite get out. You need to make sure that you file your toenails off and cut them straight across and wash and dry your feet really well. And, and between your toes, you want to make sure you really dry those. And the bottom picture shows you that you need to check inside your shoes. Don't go barefoot. And uh, wear comfortable socks. They say that cotton socks cause quite a bit of problem um, with sweating. And with a diabetic, you don't want the extra friction. And so now they're saying that it's best if you wear nylon socks. They don't cause um, the diabetic to sweat near as much and you shouldn't ever put a moisturizing cream in between your toes because that also causes friction and if you don't definitely don't want to get an ulcer started in between your toes. So now I'm back I'm down to the one of the brand new called Diabetes Sweet, and it's brand, the brand new um, sugar artificial sweetener on the market. Um, I've tried it, and you use the same amount as you would um, for regular sugar. If your recipe calls for um, like a, a cup of sugar, then you would use a cup of this Diabetes Sweet. And it does not have a, a pleasant, unpleasant aftertaste. Um, it's ideal for cooking and baking. It contains, I'm going to see if I can get this word out, <laughs> asasolomic, asasolomic, <laughs> is that good? And um, also, that is a non-nutritive sweetener, and isomalt it also contains, and it's a heat stabilizing agent, that's what the isomalt is. It contains no asperitine, no saccharin, fructose, sorbitol, or dextrose. And now they have it at Walmart, Walgreens, and Kmart. So, um, and another thing is, um, well, I have several diabetics from time to time ask me if they can drink alcohol whenever they're a diabetic. My answer is in moderation, because um, alcohol can definitely cause your cholesterol to go up. And you need to definitely make sure that you always eat whenever you're going to have a drink. Because what happens is that um, it kicks the, at the alcohol stops the liver from being able to secrete sugar. And if you don't eat with it, then your um, liver completely shuts down and you go into hypoglycemia or really low blood sugars and it's very hard to get those sugars up. So um, you can have one or two drinks a day but you need to make sure that you work that into your plan. Because um, two drinks of alcohol is um, one, uh, two, fat, two fat exchanges is uh, two drinks. Or it has seven calories per gram. So. And I think that concludes my presentation. I have um, a lot of cookbooks up here. I know I went a little bit over. Uh, if you want to look at them later, these are the ones that I have used for probably 10 years or so, and some of them I've just bought recently. They're uh, very good. I've really enjoyed most of the recipes, and so you can look at those later. 
in your packets I included um, a deal here for you to write your medications on and also you can write your um, next of kin and any allergies and you can fold them up and put them in your wallet. So, um, and the Nova pin is one thing that I uh, need to tell you about. You probably, and if any of you were here last year, the Nova pin is a wonderful thing that you can use. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. The insulin is good for 14 days and you can use it whenever you go on a traveling, um, go traveling. And it has a cartridge and actually the insulin is inside and a little needle and you actually dial the number of doses. And it makes it really nice so that you don't have to worry about refrigerating insulin and carrying extra syringes with you. It's good for 14 days without refrigeration. So a lot of people use these when they go on trips. And as your eye start, eyesight starts to fail, um, you can get a magnifier on your insulin syringe. I mean, it just fits right on your syringe and then you can see the units that you are um, going to pull up. It makes it very handy for a person that their eyesight's getting bad. So I think that concludes my um, presentation. I will have Christy come up and talk about uh, diabetes diet. Thank you. and I'm the dietitian here at Jefferson County Hospital and um, this is going to be hard for me because I usually do this talk in two hours and now I'm going to try and narrow it down to a half an hour so um, it should be interesting Try to keep me on track if I get sidetracked. Um, some of you have seen before individually or I may have seen you in class before if you came to um, this presentation last year. What I'm going to be talking about today is carbohydrate counting. Um, has anybody been to see me or does anybody know what a carbohydrate is, that's where we're going to start, I guess. Does it sound familiar at least? I guess I should warn you, I'm very interactive. I, I'd, I want you guys to talk to me too. So, um, Has anybody heard of a carbohydrate before? Yes. All right, yes. well, we'll start there. How about which kinds of foods have carbohydrate in them? Jane went over this in her talk, so we'll see All if you're paying attention. All the ones you're not supposed to have. There's three different kinds of foods that have carbohydrates in them. One of them that most people think of right off the bat is the starchy foods, like your breads and cereals, pasta, potatoes, rice, those kinds of things. There's two other kinds of foods that have carbohydrate in them. Fruit, that's one of them. And what's the third one? The milks, exactly. All three of those foods have carbohydrate in them. And why is carbohydrate so important when we're talking about a diabetic diet? What does carbohydrate do in our body? It turns, it turns to sugar and it changes our blood glucose levels. So the goals of a diabetic diet then are what? What, what are we trying to achieve by following a diet for our diabetes? Stay away from sugar. Well, sort of. Staying away from carbohydrate, sort of. Um, maybe just modifying our carbohydrate intake. But why do we need to modify our carbohydrate intake? What's, what's the big picture? What are we trying to do? Blood Keep your blood sugars under control, exactly. There's a couple of other things. Um, Jane hit on a lot of them during her talk, so I'm glad I was here to, to listen to that. Um, she talked about some side effects that can happen if your blood sugar doesn't stay under control. What are some of those side effects? Did anybody, any hear, anybody hear any of those? Circulatory. Circulatory problems. Eyes. Eye problems, definitely. Nephropathy, neuropathy, blindness, gastroparesis, you didn't talk about that one, but a lot of people do eventually have, have trouble with their digestive system as well. Um, so all of these things, the good news is that all of those things can, can be prevented. They don't have to happen. A lot of people think that, um, you know, they get diagnosed with diabetes and, oh, you know, grandma, whoever was was 80 years old and she had a leg amputated and she was in a wheelchair and she was blind because she had diabetes. Well, 
it doesn't have to be that way anymore because we know how to keep your blood sugars under control. And by taking your medicine, following your diet, and doing your exercise like you're supposed to, those things don't have to happen. So we talked about which foods have carbohydrate in them. And what about a carbohydrate choice? Has anybody heard of a carbohydrate choice before? If any's been, anybody's been to see me, they got one of these little purple booklets. I made copies of these and they have a blue cover. They're in your packet. So everybody should have one of these. And the very first sentence on the very first page inside, it says one carbohydrate choice is the amount of food that has about 15 grams of carbohydrate in it. So what does that mean? Does it mean that you can eat all, your, all you want of all these carbohydrate foods? Probably not. What that kind of gets down to is that you need to watch your portion sizes. If you look at your, your booklet, it's going to look differently than mine. But it'll list all your different carbohydrate foods. You've got your starchy foods, you've got your fruits, you've got your milks, all on this first page. And it lists your portion sizes down the middle of the page. And that's the most important thing, is to watch those portion sizes. Um, probably the, the latest thing that we've been talking about as far as diet and diabetes is that we used to teach that the people that had diabetes couldn't have concentrated sweets. No cake, no pie, no cookies, no ice cream. Those things were definitely out for people that had diabetes. And what we've found over the last five years, maybe ten years or so, is that carbohydrate is carbohydrate no matter where it comes from. So the carbohydrate that comes from a potato is the same carbohydrate that you'd find in ice cream or cake or pie or cookies. The, the, what really matters in the diabetic diet in controlling your blood glucose levels is the, is the amount that you take in. So 15 grams is 15 grams no matter where it comes from. But you have to watch your portion sizes so that you know how much is 15 grams. And that's where that handout comes in. So you can look and see what your portion sizes are. For instance, you'll find one, one slice of bread is one carbohydrate choice. So it equals 15 grams of carbohydrate. If you look down the list, um, potato is on there. Half a cup of potatoes is one carbohydrate choice. So it has 15 grams of carbohydrate. Is this making sense to everybody so far? Same down there with the fruits, whether it's fresh fruit, canned fruit, fruit juice, or even dried fruit like prunes or raisins. All of those count as carbohydrate choices, and you just need to watch your portion sizes. For the most part, one piece of fruit is a, is a serving size, like an apple, an orange, or a pear. Um, some things, like a banana, are a little bit. It's kind of a more starchy type of a fruit, um, so half a banana is a serving size. A whole banana counts as two choices. Fruit juice, a half a cup is a serving size, and that's where a lot of people tend to go overboard because not many people drink four ounces of fruit juice at a time. That's a pretty small serving. Um, I don't even see a four ounce cup over there. <coughs> We've got an eight ounce cup. That's the smallest one we have. So half of that. How many people would drink a half a, half a glass of orange juice like that? <coughs> Probably not very many. <coughs> and that's why it's very easy for people to go overboard on fruit juice. It's not that you can't have it. It's you need to watch your serving size and stick to that half a cup. Does anybody have questions on anything so far? I don't want to move too fast and lose anybody. He likes tomato juice. Is that the same serving size? Tomato juice is actually going to count as a vegetable, so it wouldn't count as a carbohydrate at all. Mm -hmm. Only the fruits, the starches, and the milks count as carbohydrate choices. So a vegetable juice would, would not count at all. Anything else I can talk about right now before I move on? I think it's important to stress about portion size like you have to. Um, because a lot of people don't realize, like a three ounce potato, how big is that? Right. And so I don't know um, how many people have actually measure the measurement things that you buy at the store. Yeah, it's very it's important very if you if you don't have your measuring they cups and measuring them, spoons out. No, they don't have. Them. <coughs> you may have to go to Walmart to get one yeah. of those measures. Just just measuring thing. just measuring cups and measuring spoons is okay. Are you talking about like a scale? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that is helpful to, we to measure your meats and to weigh them so that you know exactly how much you're getting every day. Um, we haven't really talked about proteins and fats yet. 
And the reason for that is because the proteins and the fats don't affect your blood sugar to much extent. They will if you eat enough of them and eventually everything does turn into glucose. However, carbohydrate is the main source of, of glucose for your body and those are the ones that, that affect your blood sugar the most. So that's why we're going to talk about those primarily today. So when we're talking about diabetes meal planning, we've talked about the types of foods that are okay to eat and so far there, there's really nothing that I've told you that you can't eat, is there? In moderation. In moderation. Everything in moderation and that's really the whole key. Um, I've had people tell me, well, I can eat anything. They said that I can eat anything, even though I have diabetes. I can, there's nothing that I can't have, and that's exactly true. There's nothing that's forbidden. There's nothing that you absolutely can't have. It's just a matter of how much you can have, and usually you have to give something else up in order to get it. You may have to give up a slice of bread at your supper in order to get your dessert. You may have to give up, oh, I don't know, a potato in order to get a fruit, but it all works. You just have to figure out your give and take. What do you have to give up in order to, to get something else? Um, and it's not something that you want to do all the time, and it's not considered cheating. A lot of people think, well, if I, if I have a piece of cake, well, that's cheating. Well, it's not. It's following your diet and knowing your diet. And the fact that you know how to make, make choices like that means that you know your diet, not that you know how to cheat. Okay, at least candy bar. Mm -hmm. My husband is into this here. No sugar added candy. Okay. But that's full of fat. Well, it also has carbohydrate in it. So there again, you should watch. You need to watch your total carbohydrate. When you look at your food label, there's a sample in that packet that you have in your hand. On the very last page, I think, is a copy of a food label. And if you look on there, there's a spot where it says total <coughs> carbohydrate. Underneath that, it says dietary fiber and sugar. Does everybody see that? How many people look at the sugar? How many people look at the carbohydrate? <laughs> and that's what you should be looking at. Scratch that sugar number off. Don't even look at it. You want to be looking at the carbohydrate because sugar is only looking at a piece of the puzzle. You need to look at all the carbohydrate that's in that food, not just the carbohydrate that's in the form of sugar. Okay? So if you look at that food that's, that's in the example, the serving size is one cup. And in that one cup, you're getting 13 grams of carbohydrate. So if you remember back to the very first thing that we said on, in this handout, one carbohydrate choice has 15 grams of carbohydrate. Does everybody remember that part? Mm -hmm. So if this food, one serving, has 13 grams of carbohydrate, how many carbohydrate choices is that? One. <clears throat> About one. So it's very important that you know how to read your food labels so that you can determine by looking at a serving size and make sure, first of all, that the serving size you're thinking of is the serving size they're talking about because it's not always the same. Um, and see how much carbohydrate is in that serving. That way you know how much you can have. Okay? Is that making sense to everybody? Okay, so we've talked about what to eat. We've talked about how much to eat. The third thing, I mean, so far we're, it sounds like a diet, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. When you think about weight loss or, or any other type of an eating plan, whether it's Weight Watchers or whatever, they talk about what you're supposed to eat, they talk about how much of everything you're supposed to eat. Do they ever talk about when you're supposed to eat? They don't really care, do they? They don't care when you have your meals, but when you're diabetic, it's very important to make sure that you time your meals in, according, in accordance with your medication and if you're not on medication, make sure that you're eating on a regular schedule so that you're not skipping meals or going too long in between meals. So has, has anybody, other than, I know one person in here has been to see me, has anybody else, anybody else been to see a dietitian and had a personal meal plan developed for them? You're never there when I come to see you. <laughs> I'm only here part time. I work yeah. both here and in Mount Pleasant, so I'm here every day, it's just a matter of what time of the day that I'm here. But I promise if you call and leave a message, I will call you back. Um, what a, a dietitian can do for you is to develop a meal plan for you, which will tell you not only how much to eat, but it also tell you when you should eat, depending on whether you take medication, what, time, what type of medication you take, 
and whether you work or not. A lot of people have a, a fluctuating work schedule. I've had people that work nights. I've had people that work second shift. And it's very important to time their meals um, when, it's, when it's convenient for them to eat and not disrupt their whole lifestyle. Um, I think that the key, the, the one thing that I like to think of is to let, not let your diabetes control you, but for you to control your diabetes. Um, don't let your life revolve around your diabetes. You, you, you do what you want to do and take care of your diabetes in the meantime. So the, the keys are what you're eating, how much you're eating, and when you're eating. And I can't tell you exactly when to eat because of that. Um, if you come and see me by yourself, um, then we can develop a meal plan for you and we'll determine what are good times for you to eat and how much carbohydrate to put in at each meal time. But I can give you an idea of, of how I determine that for people. If you look at, in your handouts, you have a, it looks like this, but it's yellow. Bright yellow. It's got a copy of my outline, but the second page will tell you how I determine how many calories everybody gets. Because the calorie level is different depending on your age, your height, and your weight. I don't just pick a random number out of the sky and decide you're going to be on an 1800 and you're going to be on a 1200. But I do use a formula to determine how many cal calories you should have every day, either to maintain the, the weight that you're at or to lose weight if that's a goal that you have. So if you look on the chart, it'll give you, um, for either a male or female person, it'll give you your height in inches and give you your approximate um, ideal body weight in kilograms. Does everybody understand the chart? So for instance, um, a man who is five foot nine, which is 69 inches, their ideal body weight would be about 73 kilograms. Everybody follow that? So if you can kind of look at the chart and find out where you fit in in that chart. Then you take your ideal body weight and you multiply it by 25 to 30. So you're going to come up with a range. And the example that I used was a five foot nine man. The ideal body weight was 73 kilograms. So multiply that by 25 to 30, you get a range of 1,825 to 2,190 calories every day. So they would need somewhere in the range of a 1,800 to 2,000 calorie diet. I would choose the lower end of the range if they were looking to lose weight, and I would choose the higher end if they wanted to maintain their weight where it is right now. Okay? Chris, one thing too, I don't know if it's in pounds on there at all. No, Okay. it's so in kilograms. There's 2.2 Pounds. It's already converted. Oh, okay. All right. I didn't yeah, it's already that. converted. I went and did that. that. We have trouble with, with people. They have trouble. They just see kilograms yeah. and they don't understand the exchange. Right. Rate, so that's an important thing, yeah. too. Almost everybody uses kilograms, but... I, I always use kilograms just because, well, I know the pharmacists like kilograms, mm -hmm. first yeah, of all. <laughs> yes, they do. And um, most of the formulas that I use are in kilograms. Um, so we just use do a little conversion and... Your, your weight is roughly half as much in kilograms as it is in, in pounds, right around half. So does everybody understand? Maybe you don't really have to understand how, I, how you get the numbers, but at least the basic concept that it's not just a random number that we come up with um, to punish you. <laughs> so if you wanted to lose, like, say, a couple of pounds a week, then you would go toward the lower end of your, of your range or even below your range. If you came up with maybe a, an 18 to 2100 range and you wanted to lose weight, you could go with maybe a 1600 calorie meal plan and that would show you faster weight loss while at the same time providing you enough carbohydrates to uh, maintain your blood glucose in a normal range. On the very last page, um, it shows some of our carbohydrate counting meal patterns. And these are the patterns that we use here in the hospital. They're pretty standard patterns, not individualized by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but it shows the different calorie levels across the top. You've got a 1,200, 1,500, 1,800, 2,000, 2,200, and 2,500. And it would show you at each, um, at each meal of the day how many carbohydrate choices you would be allowed. So if you look at, say, an 1,800 calorie range, you would get 15 carbohydrate choices for the whole day. Does everybody remember how many 
carbohydrate grams are in one carbohydrate choice? 15. So if you multiply 15 by 15, 15 choices a day, 15 grams per choice, you should get around 225 grams of carbohydrate for the whole day. And that doesn't mean you get to have it all at breakfast. You have to split it all up during the whole day. So we split the day up into three meals every day and three snacks every day. So you'll have a breakfast, a lunch, and a supper. You'll have a morning snack, an afternoon snack, and a snack before you go to bed. And that snack before you go to bed is probably the most important out of all the, all the three snacks. That snack before bedtime is the most important. Because remember I said you don't want to go too long without eating. Probably no more than four or five hours without having something to eat. Um, and that's a long stretch if you think about what time your supper is, maybe around six o'clock in the evening, and your breakfast maybe isn't until six o'clock the next morning, that's 12 hours without something to eat. So that snack before bed is very important, so it kind of closes that gap between breakfast and supper so that your blood sugar doesn't drop during the night. Does that make sense? If you don't have the three o'clock snack, can you put it somewhere else? I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> what does everybody think? No, if you no, skip a snack, what not. do you think? You well, I... <laughs> if you skip a snack or if you skip a carbohydrate anywhere during the day, it's just gone forever. <laughs> you never get it back. <laughs> and the reason for that, if you think about it logically, the whole key to this is consistency. You want to keep your meals consistent, your times consistent, so that your blood glucose stays consistent. And if you take a carbohydrate from your breakfast, which makes it smaller, add it to your lunch, which makes it bigger, you've now thrown everything out of whack. So you're not consistent anymore. So if you, if you skip one, it's just gone forever. So is diet making a little bit more sense to everybody? Some vegetables are considered carbohydrates. There are certain starchy vegetables, like your potatoes, your corn, your peas. Like tomatoes and lettuce. And tomatoes, lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower, green beans, none of those count as carbohydrates. They're, they're pretty much free. Unless you're having as much as three servings, then you would have to count them as a carbohydrate. Each serving of a vegetable has five grams of carbohydrate in it. And remember, one carbohydrate choice is 15 grams. So if you have three servings of a vegetable, it comes up to 15, and then you have to count it. Um, but the <laughs> servings are pretty big. They're pretty generous for a vegetable. A raw vegetable, you, have, you get to have a whole cup for one serving. So if you're not going to eat three cups of raw vegetables, then you're OK. <laughs> Cooked vegetables is a half a cup. So unless you're eating a cup and a half of a vegetable, you're OK. OK? Now we've only talked about carbohydrates so far. Um, and a lot of people think, while well, they're on a diabetic diet, they need to have low carbohydrate. And that's actually not true. The recommendations for carbohydrate, protein, and fat are exactly the same for me and for all of you that have diabetes. You want 50% of your calories to come from carbohydrate. And that's no different from you or your neighbor or whoever, um, unless they have some other medical condition. But um, for the general public and for a normal healthy diet, 50% of your calories should come from carbohydrate. You want about 20% of your calories to come from protein and less than 30% to come from fat. Now the protein and the fats, remember, don't affect your blood sugar to much extent. However, they do add extra calories and extra fat grams to your diet. And fat itself can kind of interfere with the way your, your insulin works. So it's important that, that people who have diabetes not only watch their carbohydrate, but watch their fat intake as well. Um, I usually tell people that we always recommend a low-fat diet for anybody that, that's diabetic um, because heart disease is more common in people that have diabetes and one of those risk factors for, for a heart disease that you can reduce is the high-fat diet. It's one thing that you can change. You can't change any of your other risk factors like your age or your family history or your diagnosis of diabetes. Those are always going to be there, but you can always change your diet. So we always recommend low fat. Anybody else have any questions that I can answer? We've got a little bit of time left, I think. I think that, generally speaking, and myself included, 
we live in a society, like Jane said earlier, Christy, about everything is quick and fast. And, you know, you drive through a fast food restaurant and they ask you, they automatically ask you if you want it super size. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to have some french fries. It's okay to have those kinds of things. Right. Super size. Everything in moderation. You know? But it's hard to make those choices sometimes. It uh, is. One thing I, I usually recommend that people plan ahead. If you know that you're going to go to McDonald's or go to Hardee's or Burger King or whatever, plan ahead. Um, bring a copy of the menu home with you and have it there so that you can decide or decide in the car what you're going to have before you go there. And try to skip the, the extras, skip the extra sauce and the mayonnaise and the, the cheese, you know. Those are all things that are just adding fat and calories to your foods. Um, and they're not things that are going to change your blood sugar, but again, they will interfere with the way your insulin is, is working in your body. Um, and they can lead to, to weight gain. Um, one thing that I didn't talk about is, is calories. Does anybody know what a calorie is? We talk about them all the time. What's a calorie? <coughs> Calories. Too many of them, they show. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> um, well, that's what I didn't mention is why that happens. Why, why do extra calories, what, what is an extra calorie? A calorie is actually energy. And, and it, the number of calories in a food is the amount of energy that you will get from that food. So if you think about your car, what does your car use for energy? Gas. So if you take your car to the gas station and fill it up with gas, and you drive home and park your car in the driveway and don't go anywhere. What happens to your gas? Nothing. It stays right there, doesn't it? And the same thing is true with calories. They're the energy for your body. And if you eat lots of energy and eat lots of calories and then you sit and do nothing, those calories just sit. And there they are. They show up on our bodies as fat deposits. And and that's why it's very easy to gain weight if you're following a low f or a higher fat or a higher protein diet because you're getting excess calories from those types of foods. I should have mentioned that earlier. Christy, have you heard um, anything about the pizza factor? No. They say that if you eat pizza when you're a diabetic, that it makes your, it is the worst food that you can have because it makes your sugars go really high and stay up there higher than any other food. And did they say why that is? Just because of the, the, everything that's in it, you know, like your yeast that you know, makes the, uh, the bread, the crust hmm. rise, you know, your cheese, and everything that does that, I don't know all, you know, everything you have on it makes the sugar just stay right up there. The way they, co they combine with each other, maybe? <laughs> I think two people have a hard time uh, monitoring their serving sizes when they have pizza. And it's very easy to overdo it by just having an extra slice or having a slice that's a little bit bigger than they normally would have had. You know, I think, I think that plays a part, too, with the, back to the old serving sizes. And what do we do? We go out with our grandchildren or our families and you want pizza. <laughs> because it's easy, because it's quick, and you know they're going to like it. Yeah, it's easy to do. So how much exercise are we going to need to take all these calories off? I would recommend at least 30 minutes every day. Um, and it doesn't have to be 30 minutes all at one time. It can be two 15-minute sessions, um, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, but a total of 30 minutes every day. Um, and uh, something that's going to get your heart rate up, not just, um, not just leisurely walking around the block, but you actually have to, have to put a little effort into it and get your heart rate up in order to burn some calories. Any other questions? If you could do Tim hula hoops, I wouldn't yeah. <laughs> Like the lady in the picture? <laughs> I didn't have my glasses on, so I couldn't tell. I thought she was wrapped up in tape at first. <laughs> wow, she's really been at it. Any other questions I can answer? I do have on the table up here, I've got um, some samples of Splenda. If anybody hasn't tried Splenda, please take some samples and, and try them out, see how you like it. It's very expensive compared to some of the other sweeteners out there, so make sure you like it before you invest in it. Um, I've got some diabetic cooking um, little cookbooks that you can get at the grocery store. They're usually right by the checkout aisle. And um, I've got some coupons where you can send it in and get a free issue um, and see how you like it again before you buy it. I'm, I'm big on freebies.
Um, I've got some recipes and another handout um, about some common myths. There's a little true-false quiz about um, what you can eat when you have diabetes. And um, if you know anybody that's diabetic that couldn't make it today, feel free to, to take some things for them and um, hopefully get the word out there that, that maybe what they think is, is true about diabetes and their diet may not actually be the right thing. There's lots of information out there, and it's real important to know who's got the right information and what to believe. So I'm, I'm glad everybody came today. Thanks for coming. pharmacists here. I'm going to talk about the medication that's used to treat diabetes, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about diabetes itself. Um, and I like to move around a lot too, like Christy does. <laughs> Everybody can see that. I know the writing's kind of small. The biggest thing we're talking about when we're talking about diabetes and whether you're talking about type 1 or type 2 is metabolic abnormalities. Um, in the type 1 diabetic, like Jane talked about, there's diminished or zero insulin secretion. In the type 2 diabetic, there's usually a combination of insulin resistance, which means there's some insulin there, but it just doesn't work like it used to. Um, there's also excess hepatic glucose production, which means there's extra glucose in the bloodstream, and then the diminished insulin secretion by the pancreas. Because it is a combination of these three things in the type 2 diabetic, a lot of type 2 diabetics can react completely different to medicine, can have different symptoms, respond differently to different medicines. So when people say they have diabetes, not all of the diabetes is the same. There's individual little differences and people respond differently. One of the big things that you have to remind is, is your diabetes might be a little bit different than somebody else's. That's the biggest thing I wanted you to take away with this. It's, it's not, a one-size-fits-all disease. It's very complex and it varies from person to person. For years, the only thing that we had to treat diabetes was oral medicine called sulfonylureals. Um, you might recognize some of the names of the medicine if you are taking oral medicine. Amaryl is one, glynase, diabeta or micronase. I won't give you the generic names. Um, <laughs> Glyburide, glucotrol, um, glucotrol comes as both a plain tablet and a long-acting or an XL form. Some of the ones down towards the bottom are not even in use anymore. Some of these drugs have been around for many, many years. As the pharmaceutical companies devise new and better medicine, um, some of the older ones that have been in use for, for several years are no longer used. It's been a long time since I've seen anybody on Oranase, Tolanase, or Dimolor. Um, Diabinase is still used occasionally as an oral agent. The biggest side effects with a lot of the drugs in this class is they do cause hypoglycemia if a person takes too much. Um, they also have a fairly high failure rate of about 5 to 10 percent of the people that are taking them each year will have to be switched to something else, have to take an additional agent because they don't work anymore or they don't work as well anymore. Um, There's a new one out that they just mentioned on the news last night. It's a combination drug. Oh, okay. What it is is, is a combination, and I'll get to it in just a oh, little bit. Okay. It's a combination of a Vandia plus another medication. Okay. Um, the main thing is it's a convenience. Instead of taking two different tablets, you you're going to be able to take one. Oh. Yeah. And it's, they're coming out with new things all the time. Um, that's one good thing about diabetes. The things that we were using and were standard of care 10 to 15 years ago are not standard of care anymore. We, we keep getting better at this. We keep 
devising new drugs, we keep devising new ways to deliver insulin. Um, and I'll touch a little bit on that later. Um, the next class of drugs, there's two drugs in this class, uh, Starlix and a medication that's called Prandin. The biggest thing with this medicine, it's taken right before a meal. If the meal is skipped, then you skip the dose. Um, what it does is it works similar to the Sofana Ureals, but it works a, a lot quicker. Um, so you'll take the medicine before a meal to, to balance out that, that increase in the blood sugar that a, that a person has after a meal. The big side effects with these two types of medicines, uh, this, these two medications is because of the way the body metabolizes them, they do have a lot of different drug interactions and they do have some potential for causing hypoglycemia, although not as bad as the sulfano ureals. The next class of drugs that they use to treat diabetes are what they call alpha glucosidase inhibitors. There's two different drugs in this class, Precos and Glycet. Um, we usually don't see a lot of people on this particular medicine because it has an extremely high rate of side effect and a lot of people will drop out of, of therapy due to the side effects. The biggest thing is gas, flatulence, abdominal pain, diarrhea, uh, and that happens in about 60% of the people who take it. And how this particular medicine works is it inhibits an enzyme in the intestinal tract so it interferes with the actual absorption of the carbohydrates from your diet. Because the carbohydrates aren't <coughs> absorbed, they pass through the gastrointestinal tract. That's what causes all the gas, the abdominal pain, the diarrhea, the things like that. Um, they also have the potential to increase hepatic enzymes so people with liver dysfunctions can't take this particular medicine. Um, the Avandia that I mentioned just a little bit ago that's out in a new form that's a combination of Avandia plus another agent and a medicine that's called Actose, it works by increasing the insulin sensitivity. People with type 2 diabetes usually have some insulin still circulating in their bloodstream, still being produced by the pancreas. It's just that the, that the cells in the liver, the fat, and the muscle don't respond to the insulin like they used to. So what they do is they increase the insulin sensitivity so the insulin that is in the body is better utilized. These two particular medicines also have a good side effect in that they decrease the triglycerides and they increase the good cholesterol, the HDL, by about 10 to 20 percent. One of the bad side effects is some people have a little bit of weight gain, two to three kilograms, which translates to about five or six pounds. Um, also with this particular medicine, the Avandia and the Actos, it does have the potential to have liver damage, so they usually perform liver function tests periodically during the first year to make sure it doesn't cause liver damage. Um, there was one drug in this class that was out before Avandia and Actos that was called Regulin, and it was pulled off the market because it did have this um, damage to the liver, the company that manufactured it. It had hepatic toxicity and they removed it from the market. One thing with the Avandia and the Actos also is that it may take six to 14 weeks to reach the full effect of it. So taking it for a few days, you might not notice the full benefit right away. And we get to insulin. I have a question. Okay. Um, um, cost wise, for people that are on There's, a lot more. There are going to be some that are less, some that are more expensive. You start talking um, the other, the older medicines, the sulfonia reels, um, they usually are less expensive than what the Avandia and Actos. And that's usually due to the number of companies manufacturing the products. When a pharmaceutical company discover, discovers a product, they have a patent on it. They have the patent for so long, so they have exclusive rights to manufacture it. Right now, these two are manufactured by two different companies. They are the only companies that make Avandia, the only companies that make Actos, so the price on those is, is still fairly high. Um, insulin. Usually the next step, um, after a person's been on one drug, it doesn't work, 
they switch them to a second drug or add a second drug in combination. Sometimes the physicians will go to a third drug or they will make a decision just to put a person on insulin. People think that being on insulin is worse than being on oral agents. It's not as convenient, but with insulin you have a lot of advantages over oral agents. It usually lowers blood sugars quicker. Um, you can control it or titrate a little bit better than you can oral agents. The biggest inconvenience right now with the insulin is the delivery of the insulin. It still requires an injection, sometimes daily, sometimes multiple times a day. Sometimes it's mixing insulin. Um, but when I mention the word insulin, a lot of people think that that's, that's a bad word. Um, with the insulin, there are several different forms of it that they're working on to, um, there's two companies working on an oral insulin. All of these products are still several years off. Um, so don't look for them or don't ask your physician about them and they're not gonna be out in the next week or so. But two companies are working on oral delivery systems for insulin where a person would be able, be able to take insulin orally um, through a special coated capsule and have it go into the bloodstream <coughs> that way. They're also working on an insulin skin patch. They're working on an insulin mouth spray. They're working on inhaled insulin, which would be inhaled into the lungs. Um, right now, some people will have an insulin pump that they program or set based on their blood sugar readings. There is one company that's working on an implantable pump that works on a feedback uh, that measures blood glucose and, and adjusts the insulin dose dependent upon what the blood sugars are. They are also working on pancreas and islet cell transplantation. So, you know, with the, with the diabetes, it's, it's something that has changed a lot over the last 10 to 15 years, and it's changing, and five and 10 years from now, it'll be a lot different than it is today. Um, there's several different type, types. If you want to look at your handout on the fourth page, third page, I'm sorry. It talks just real briefly about some of the different types of insulin. There's some short-acting insulin, rapid-acting insulin, intermediate-acting insulin, and long-acting insulin. And by the different types of insulin, you can look at the onset. Some of them are, have a faster onset. Um, some have a, a longer onset, some have a, a longer duration, and usually what we do is we have a mixture of the insulin. We'll, we'll use a combination of the short-acting insulin like the Humulin or the Nobulin R or the Humalog, um, which will respond to an increase in the blood sugar quite rapidly and mix it with a longer, longer or an intermediate-acting insulin to provide longer coverage so a person can get by with only using one or two injections a day. There are several different companies that make a combination insulin um, that's 70% and 30%, so it's already pre-mixed. Is anybody here currently using insulin? Okay, are you on a fixed combination? Mm -hmm. Okay, 70-30? 75-25? Seven, okay. 70-30 70, 30, and R? Okay. Um, for the people that are mixing insulin, you've probably heard this information several times, but on the last page, there is also a, a diagram showing the proper way of mixing two insulins in the same syringe. Um, when I became a pharmacist many years ago, most of the insulin was derived from animal products. It was beef, pork, insulin. Uh, now all the human, all the insulin is human insulin. Now that doesn't mean it comes from humans. What they've done is the pharmaceutical companies have trained bacteria to manufacture insulin that's exactly like a human's DNA. Mm -hmm. So the human insulin that you're injecting now is synthetically made in a laboratory by bacteria, but it's exactly like the insulin that your body produces. <laughs> And that might not seem like a big advantage, but to what it was 15 and 20 years ago, the people that were using beef and pork insulin, there, there were reactions due to that because it wasn't specifically like human insulin. 
Um, some people could use beef, some people could use pork, but the DNA structure is slightly different and there would be people who were not able to take it. But um, as, I, as I told you with some of the things that are coming out in the future with the different delivery systems for the insulin, you can tell that this is something a lot of the different pharmaceutical companies are working very hard at getting a better, more convenient way to deliver insulin than the injection. And ballpark figure, I would probably say it's going to be three to five years before you actually see it on the market, but it will happen probably within five years if I was guessing. What's next? I've kind of already talked to you about this. You know, the two different oral delivery systems. There's a skin patch one of the companies is working on, mouth spray, inhaled insulin, the implantable pump, and the transplants. The biggest thing with people with diabetes, I can tell you two different people that I know personally, um, both diabetics, both type 2, Biggest thing you can do for yourself is be involved in your care and your self-care. Nobody's going to know your diabetes better than you. Be informed about your diabetes. Um, there's some websites listed up here. Get as much information as you can. If you have questions, make sure you ask. Um, the reason why the self-care you know, you're going to see your doctor periodically, you're going to see your pharmacist periodically, you're going to see your dietitian periodically, but it's going to be you that has to watch their diet, follow the dietitian's recommendations, and that's very hard sometimes. Exercise, you know, and, and like Christine talked about, it's a balance. You know, if you, if you take more calories in, you may have to exercise a little more. If you're not feeling well, and you're not going to be able to exercise, you may need to decrease your calories a little bit, and it varies from person to person. So, you know, you, one author that I have, have read several works who's, who's in the American Diabetes Association says, you know, 95% of your care should be self-care. This is your diabetes. Treat it as best you can. And you can do this by being informed, know your choices. Um, and we talk about the complications. Jane kind of briefly mentioned this. But a 1% reduction in the hemoglobin A1C leads to a 25 to 30% decrease in the complications. So a little bit of a decrease in controlling the blood sugars. And, and this hemoglobin A1C has anybody ever heard that term or heard the doctors talk about it at all? Okay, you have. Has anybody else? You have? Okay. When you check your blood sugars, it gives you a more immediate reading of what your blood sugar is right here and now. This hemoglobin A1C is like an average over the last three months. You can't cheat on it. This is, a, this is a more accurate determination of what your blood sugars and how your diabetes is being treated. Somebody knows they have a doctor's appointment coming up or somebody knows that they're going in for lab work, they can really watch their diet, exercise for a week to two weeks before they go in. They may have normal blood sugars, but if they haven't been doing the things they're supposed to, this hemoglobin A1C is going to be higher and the doctor's going to know. One blood test can go back three months. Correct. Really? Very much. This is like an average. This is like an average of your blood sugars. You can't cheat. You can't cheat. You cannot cheat on this. This is an average of your blood sugars. And it's a more accurate determination. I mean, it, it takes the peaks and valleys out of the day to day, and it gives a more accurate, and, and like Christine talked about, you know, we're looking for this mealtime spread out. We're looking for, you know, the medication spaced at the right time, you know, to optimize it for each and every person. And this hemoglobin A1C gives us a better representation of how well you're reaching that. It's just hard to believe that's stored in your body somewhere that they can pull that little. They can pull that out, <laughs> and it's an average of like the last three months. I'll be darned. Yep. But a 1% but a reduction in that, if you can go from 9 to 8, you can go from 10 to 9, doesn't matter what the 1% is, you're going to decrease the complications by 25 to 30%. 
decreasing and keeping the blood pressure in check by 10 points. So going from 140 to 130, 90 to 80 for the two different blood pressure levels, you're going to increase mortality, which is death, 25 to 55%. So this is very important to the physicians, going to be very important to you to keep track of this, you know, watch the diet, watch the exercise, take the medicine or take the insulin like the doctors prescribed. Um, you know, and it's all balance. You know, moderation here, moderation there. Um, what, are, what about on sick days? Um, sick days, it's going to vary depending upon what the person's, whether they're on oral agents, whether they're on insulin, and that's something <coughs> probably would be better to talk to each person specifically. Um, but I want to tell you a, a story about two people I know. My grandmother was diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic. Doctor put her on oral agents. She changed her diet, started exercising, and her dose went from 5 milligrams to 2.5 milligrams to 1 and a quarter milligrams of an oral agent. And then the doctor took her off the oral agent, and she wasn't on anything until she died. Another person um, that I know was diagnosed and didn't feel bad, ate what he wanted to, when he wanted to, didn't take his medicine. Um, that person is now in his late 50s, is legally blind, has had several digits on his toe amputated, um, and is in constant pain from the neuropathy or the dying of the nerves in his extremities, his hands and his feet. So diabetes is, is a disease and it's kind of up to you which course it takes. You know, it, I don't want to scare you, but I also don't want you to leave here thinking that this isn't a very serious disease. You may not feel that bad now, but the microvascular, the cardiovascular complications, the neuropathy, all of these are pre preventable. Um, even though they're preventable for most diabetics, blindness, diabetes is still the leading cause of blindness in the United States. Um, Non-traumatic lower limb amputations, diabetes is the cause of it. Even though we know that keeping the blood sugars under good control will prevent these things from happening. And how do we do that? It's a mixture of the exercise, the diet, the medication, you know, taking care of everything. Any questions? Uh, my name is Linda Coates and I'm a physical therapist uh, at Jefferson County Hospital. Uh, been doing this for about 25 years, so I may have some old information and some new information for you. Um, as you know, exercise is one of the three key things you can do to help control your diabetes. And it's really, it's relatively a simple thing to do, but it takes a lot of willpower. Um, and determination to follow through. It's real easy if you skip exercise one day to think, well, I'm kind of tired today. I don't think I want to do anything today. I'll give myself a day off. And then the next day I think, well, I felt pretty good yesterday. It was kind of nice not to have to do that exercise and um, get out of the habit. So I'll tell you about all the benefits of exercise. And then I'll ask you that question, how many are exercising? Find out where we're at. Um, Exercise recommendations. They recommend that before you do any kind of an exercise program, number one, that you get a clearance with your doctor first. Because if you've got any cardiovascular problems then there, or any other complications from diabetes, there are some uh, different types of exercise we would recommend for you uh, versus just a general program. So I caution you with that before I give you all these general recommendations. Know that you need to have cleared with your doctor that it's okay to have an exercise program. We'll talk about some of the complications and the types of exercise you should avoid and the types of exercise you should look for if you have any of those complications. Um, to begin with, with an exercise program, they recommend you have a little warm-up period, five to ten minutes, just to get the, the blood flowing in your muscles again. That can be as simple as just walking around the house. What you don't want to do 
is to have been sitting in a chair for a couple hours, not moving, and then jump up and think you're gonna do an aerobic exercise program. Because your muscles aren't gonna be ready for it and you're apt to hurt yourself, okay? So you need a gentle warm-up period. Just walk around the house for five minutes so that you get the blood pumping. The second thing you need to do is just a little bit of stretching for five or 10 minutes so that the muscles are ready to do the work you're gonna ask them to do. It's not in, nothing uh, real complicated with stretches. I mean, it's just as simple as a few little side stretches, side to side, you know, raising an arm up overhead, stretching it out a little bit. You know, do a little back bend um, with your legs. You know, you can stretch out to the side a little bit and loosen your hips up. Maybe, you know, lift a leg up and down a couple times this way. Make sure we're getting the muscles loosened up before we ask them to do an activity. It won't take any longer than five or 10 minutes to do that. Uh, the third thing that you have in your exercise program is the actual activity. And the activity could be such things as um, a walking <coughs> program, a running program, a rowing program, a swimming program, etc. And we'll talk about some of those um, activities a little bit later here. How often do you do it? Three to five times a week. That's what the recommended is, three to five times a week. Initially, just to get conditioned when you start an exercise program, it's going to take about four to six weeks doing this, whatever program we start, just to get the conditioning. You will see improvement in the next four to five months. And then you'll, you'll kind of plateau out. You'll stay at that level. It's maintenance after that point. Um, so, I mean, if you think about controlling the effects of diabetes for the rest of your life, three to five times a week for a 20 to 30 minute exercise period, that's really not a whole lot to ask with the positive effects you're gonna get. Um, benefits of exercise. It will increase your strength. It will improve cardiovascular function. It will improve the insulin binding and sensitivity. And that's where John was talking his grandma started exercising, they began to lower the amount of insulin he required. Your body um, is more sensitive. It improves that blood glucose control. It will decrease your blood pressure, and he talked about decreasing your blood pressure by lowering it 10 millimeters. Um, helps with re weight reduction. Decreases stress and tension. And in general, it can make you just feel better about life. It's uh, general all around good for you here. The American College of Sports Medicine, if anybody's into athletics, they will say duration is anywhere from 20 to 60 minutes, depending on what your activity is, to get, some of the, to get the conditioning effects. And people say, well, how do I know if I'm exercising too hard? If your doctor has cleared you to exercise, then as long as you're exercising, if you can talk to somebody, and not be short of breath, <coughs> then that's the appropriate level of exercise. If you're doing an activity and you're huffing and you're puffing and you couldn't carry on a conversation with someone, then you're pushing it too hard. You should be able to talk to that person and not be short of breath, okay? As far as general exercise guidelines, I listed those on your sheet that I handed out to you. As I said, check with your doctor first before you would start a program. You need to eat at least an hour before you exercise or when the insulin's not at its peak with, with your uh, activity. Try to exercise at about the same time every day. That helps with regulating that blood sugar and your insulin. Wear sturdy shoes. Does anybody know why? Want to wear socks that will wick moisture away from your feet. You want to wear sturdy shoes, shoes that have what they call a wide toe box, not these little pointy things. Um, something has a nice gel pad that will absorb shock. Why do we want to take such good care of our feet? Don't want to lose them. Don't want to lose them. It's sometimes, depending on the stage of the disease, you've lost some sensitivity in your feet. And you can't feel when that blister's happening. You don't know when you've hurt your foot and we know it takes longer for us to heal sores if we get them on our feet. So if we wear good shoes to start with and we wear socks that will wick the moisture away, 
then we're taking care of our feet and avoiding some complications that can happen from that. They recommend that you, if you're injecting insulin, that you don't inject that short-acting insulin in muscles or the side of the body close to the area that's being exercised a lot because that can make the blood sugar drop very quickly. For instance, if you're doing strengthening exercises with your arms, if that's part of what you've chosen to do, if that's the kind of insulin you're on, if you're exercising your arms a lot that day, then you shouldn't be injecting the insulin in that big muscle when you're going to turn around and start exercising real heavy. You should use a different muscle group. They recommend you monitor your blood sugar level 30 minutes before exercise, after you exercise, and every 30 minutes during heavy exercise if you're doing some kind of a heavy running program or something where you're exercising for 60 minutes or whatever. Check that out every 30 minutes to know where you're at. Carry glucose tablets with you or something, a sugar candy, something if your blood sugar would go down that you would have access to, to uh, take care of that problem. Do you know what the signs and symptoms are if your blood sugar is too low? Weakness, dizziness. Weakness, dizziness, <coughs> kind of shaky. Um, sweat more. Sometimes the heart's beating faster. So those, you need to watch for those signs that you, your blood sugar is getting too low. If you would decide to exercise and your blood sugar is 250 above or 240 above, I've seen different things written on that. They recommend that you not exercise at that time because you're going to be using fat. Um, you'll be, uh, your body will be metabolizing fat for the energy. Blood sugar is high. You'll have a high production of ketones. And then you'll have that sugary breath. And you can get into that, what do they call it, keto acidosis. acidosis is the proper medical term for it, when the blood sugar is too high. So do you know what the signs and symptoms of that would be? We talked about fruity breath. Tired and restless. Short of breath sometimes. Think of anything else? Upset stomach sometimes, dry mouth. So if you'd start to be feeling that, your blood sugar could be too high. They recommend that you avoid any kind of a high intensity activity that could cause any kind of trauma to your feet or your eyes. Drink lots of water before you exercise and after you exercise. And always carry some kind of a medical alert with you that says I'm diabetic. So if you'd have a problem, and someone came upon you and you couldn't tell them what the problem was, they would know you were diabetic. It gives them a heads up on what to do to try and help you. Um, and the number one thing I think as far as being successful in an exercise program is to try and exercise with a friend. I don't care if you're diabetic or you're just on a regular exercise program, you're in the arthritis exercise class, whatever it is, if you have somebody you're exercising with, you're more apt to carry the program through. It's real easy to talk yourself out of it. It's a lot harder to tell your friend who came to the door to go walking with you, I don't feel like it today. You can go on without me. If you can get an exercise buddy, you're going to be more successful. And they say, do you know how long it takes to turn an activity into a habit? How many times do you have to do it before it becomes habit and you're just going to automatically do it? 21 to 24 days, you're right, three weeks. If you can get yourself on a program and make yourself do it for three weeks, it'll become a habit, it becomes part of your life. So if you can get through that first three weeks, you're probably set and get you an exercise buddy so you can keep exercising. Contraindications or concerns that you'd want to talk about with your physician before you'd start an exercise program. If, he's, if you've been told you have any kind of cardiovascular disease, you need to talk that over with them. If you have poor controls of blood glucose levels, it's up, it's down, and you just can't quite get it regulated, you need to talk to the doc before you start any kind of an exercise program because that's going to affect it. You need some input with that. If you have poorly controlled conditions of diabetes, such as a peripheral neuropathy, 
where you can't, don't have the good sensation in your feet. They recommend that actually for your exercise program you avoid weight bearing activities and do things like swimming, biking, and rowing. Have you ever heard of a condition called autonomic neuropathy? We have nerves in our, our body that tell our muscles to move. We have nerves in our body that tell our smooth muscles to move. Smooth muscle being like in your blood vessels, your gut. So if you've got an autonomic neuropathy, that means the nerves sending signals to those muscles aren't sending good signals. You're not getting good control. So if you have anything like that, then you maybe you're going to have more trouble controlling your blood pressure because it's that nervous system that controls your blood vessels. So people who stand upright, they go from sitting down to standing up, it's really easy for them to pass out. Have you ever heard of hypotension, orthostatic hypotension? That can be a problem. Um, if you have any tendency towards that, well then do a, an exercise where you're not standing, but you're sitting. Maybe you're doing a recumbent bike where you're sitting in a chair, working your legs, um, or maybe swimming <coughs> would be more of a, an appropriate exercise. Something where you don't have to be upright all the time. Autonomic um, dysfunction can also affect what they call thermal regulation or temperature control in your body. So if you have any problems with that, don't exercise in extreme heat or extreme cold. So your body isn't being taxed in those conditions. The other problem we see with diabetes that has been alluded to was eye problems, the ret retinopathy. So if you're prone to that, then any kind of a real strenuous, jarring exercise could cause some hemorrhage. They call it retinal um, hemorrhage or retinal detachment sometimes. So if you have that problem, you need to do an exercise that isn't a lot of jerky, bouncing, traumatic type things. You avoid activities that also could cause a sudden increase in your blood pressure because that would also <coughs> cause stress to your, your eyes. So that's why we say you need to talk to a doctor first before you start an exercise program. He gives you clearance. Then PT could help you with an exercise program or we could give you general guidelines and say, here's what you, you need to do. Any questions about what we just talked about? Then let's look at the quiz. Let's see. We'll go by, first of all, how many exercise in here regularly? Let's see hands. You guys are doing better than me. I walk here in the hospital. Occasionally I walk at home, and that's about it. So good for you. You should pat yourselves on the back. Let's look through these questions here now. The first one, I am over 50 years old, and I have diabetes. I should not exercise. I am too old. False. False. Good, good. I am on a low-calorie diet, so I can skip the exercise. False. False. That's right. Exercise is a part of your diabetes treatment. True. If your exercise workout isn't tough, it's not helping. No pain, no gain. False. That's false. Eating a snack before you exercise is very important. True. What do you think? I said false. Let's see. True, false. True. 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 That's one where there's mixed results. It depends. It depends. Because if you eat something, you're going to jack the blood sugar up, mm -hmm. and you're trying to use exercise to help control the blood sugar. In general, on the diabetes website, I answered this one wrong when I took the quiz. <laughs> I thought, well, what are they talking about? But, Yeah. It is, well, they, the Diabetes Association said false, and I'll read you their answer. Most people with type 2 diabetes use exercise to bring blood sugar levels down. Exercise is one of the most effective ways to lower blood sugar. Having a snack just before your exercise could increase the blood sugar levels during exercise and would counteract all the good blood sugar lowering effects of the exercise. We talked about checking your, your blood sugar level before you exercise. Obviously, if it's low before you're starting, you want to do something about that. But if it's at your recommended level, then they're saying, no, you don't need to take anything before you exercise. It says the eat a snack before exercising rule is meant for people who use insulin. 
uh, or that big word John used, sulfone or whoever medication, <laughs> and their blood sugar levels before exercise, before lowering, uh, before exercise is normal. So um, it says if you take insulin or those drugs, carry raisins, candy, glucose tablets with you. So if you feel like it's lowering, you can take something. So that's their reasoning. In general, no. But like we said, you're checking your exercise or your blood sugar levels before you ever do it. Six, I have complications from diabetes and exercise will make them worse. False, that's right. Now if you're taking care of yourself. I take insulin. When I exercise, I am most likely to get low blood sugar during my workout. False, actually false. Actually, the blood, low blood sugar is more apt to happen in the hours after exercise than during the exercise. You have to be careful. Um, the, two, were they? Seven Ac and eight. Actually, the effects of the exercise can happen anywhere from 8 to 24 hours after you did it. Isn't that interesting? That's the carryover effect. Mm -hmm. So you need to watch. <laughs> I can avoid uh, exercise-induced low blood glucose by exercising one to three hours after eating a meal. Actually, it's true. While you're digesting a meal, your body has more blood sugar available to serve as energy, so even when the insulin's at work, the extra glucose helps protect you. So that's how the diet would work with that. Does that make sense to you, Christine? Yes, Dietitian says yes. <laughs> <laughs> Must be true. <laughs> okay, number nine here. This time I'm going to stick with my walking program. I have tried before, but I never seem to be able to stick with it. This time I'll try to up the odds on sticking with the program by A, B, or C? C. 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 Get a walking partner. Okay, 10. You are about to set off on your daily 45 minute walk. The most important thing to take with you is your? A. 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 Your diabetes identification. C would be good though, too. That would, that would be a good choice, too, to have something extra you never with know you. When you might. That's right. But if you got into the problem and you had your raisins, but you, you <laughs> were unconscious, <laughs> they might not know to give you the, re, the raisins you had in your pocket. I'd rather take like orange juice. That's fine. Wrong. Just something you can use mm -hmm. to Sounds help your fine. blood sugar. Mm -hmm. To lose well, weight. Well, you can show. take. Wait. It wouldn't do it fast. You can. Uh, you can soak on. Uh, you can yeah. suck on a piece of candy, but yeah. it, there's a chance you could choke on it. Hopefully, your sugar levels would raise quick enough, and you wouldn't. What do you think, Nurse Jane? I think that taking uh, blood, little uh, glucose tablets mm -hmm. would be better. Yes. Yes. Do they? Yeah, and you can carry them right in your pocket. Different flavors. Too. Where do you get those at? At the pharmacy. Any pharmacy? Any pharmacy? I've never seen those. Mm -hmm. Have you all seen them before? No? Came in the pack. In the, oh, in, in, yeah, in the information in the pack? New yeah. starter pack. Okay. <laughs> a little quicker. They look like a little kid's Tylenol or children's Motrin. Chewable. Chewable thing. Right. Chewable aspirin. Something like that. The same basic concept. It's just sugar. Okay. To lose weight, I need to exercise. A, B, or C? C. C. Five or times, five or more times C. a week. You got it. And the last one. Which of the following is not exercise equipment? D. What do you think? D. E. D. E. 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 D. E. D. First, I want the soup can. <laughs> the soup can? You want to open it and yeah, eat it, I right? Know. Well, you know. Yeah. You, we are going to eat You can that. do that. The bike you can ride, the dog you can walk, the stairs you can climb, and the sidewalk you walk. That's the trick question. All of them are. All of them. Look at you. I said there was more than That was the tricky one. Okay. Any questions? If I don't know the answer, one of these ladies will, I'm sure. All of them would be okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.